everybody. What a, what a pleasure and a joy it is to be here and to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and some battle-scarred veterans of trips to the <laughs> Middle East, including Egypt, our famous trip. <laughs> CTU itself, as uh, many of you know, has been uh, really invested in the lands of the Bible uh, as an institution really since 1979 when we began our overseas study program. Uh, and uh, our group goes each year now to Bethany for a semester and we have retreats in the Holy Land. And in addition, a number of us on the faculty uh, have led uh, study tours of that place. It's very dear to, to all of us and certainly dear to me. Uh, I think what we could call the Holy Land has always had a a fascination for people of faith. It's obviously true of Jews whose religious roots sink deep into the lands of ancient Israel and its long and complex and wondrous history. For Islam too, these lands are sacred because it was there that Muhammad the prophet dwelled in that region and revealed God's will through the Quran. And obviously for Christians, this part of the world is sacred. We consider the history of the Jewish people to be part of our own religious ancestry, and we revere the land where Jesus, the incarnate word, lived and died and rose. For all three faiths, Jerusalem, the epicenter of these biblical lands, has been an object of pilgrimage to this day. When referring to the Holy Land, uh, I'm referring uh, not simply to Israel, Palestine and Jordan, where most of the biblical sites related to the New Testament for sure are located. But I'm thinking of uh, the wider region here. Uh, we can think of uh, Iran and Iraq uh, as places where Abraham uh, came from, uh, the place where the Magi and Matthew's infancy narrative originate. We think of Syria, that tortured country today, uh, where a uh, scene of Paul's conversion in the New Testament and his later formation as a Christian. We think of Lebanon, a tiny country there, uh, always associated with the biblical lands and the peoples, particularly its beauty, the cedars of Lebanon, the snows of Mount Hermon. We think of Egypt, a major player, of course, always in the history of the Middle East to this day, place of the Exodus, but also place of refuge for Joseph and his brothers and his father, and also refuge for the Holy Family, again, according to Matthew's account. And we know that now, as so often in the past, these sacred lands, this holy land, is scarred with tension, divisions, threat, and violence. Our focus this afternoon is on the fate of Christians in this region. But at the same time, we don't want to forget that many innocent people from all three of the Abrahamic traditions and beyond are suffering in this region as we speak. Speaking of the circumstances of Christians, at a recent hearing before a congressional committee, both Archbishop Francis Chulicott, the permanent Vatican observer to the United Nations, along with noted journalist John Allen, now of uh, the Boston Globe and formerly of the National Catholic Reporter, testified that Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the entire world. Uh, and uh, they were citing examples uh, from Nigeria, from the Sudan, from China and other places. But referring specifically to the Middle East, the Archbishop described what he called, quote, flagrant and widespread persecution of Christians in the Middle East for no other reason than their religious faith." End quote. As I have discovered in my preparation for being with you today, this is a very difficult and indeed sensitive topic. First of all, because the situation is in flux. What might have been said on this subject two or three years ago has significantly changed because of new circumstances, for example, in Egypt and Syria and Iraq, and most recently, ominously, in Lebanon. Rapidly changing political circumstances 
and the escalation of violence and conflict in these countries, for example, have had a direct impact on Christians as well as the rest of the population. We also have to note that solid information is hard to find. In many countries, there has not been any census taken for years. In Syria, for example, since 1935. And even decades, so that there is wild fluctuation in the estimate of how many Christians are in fact in a particular region. And of course, as we shall see, the situation of Christians is not uniform across this region. In some areas, Christians enjoy relative peace and security. In others, they're under threat and in danger. And analysis of what the situation of Christians in this region might be are also influenced by what we could call very different perspectives or narratives on what exactly is the status of Christians in the Middle East. That narrative is affected by other political perspectives and motivations, and sometimes description of the plight of Christians is used, for example, to advance anti-Muslim or anti-Israel perspectives. One finds, too, that Christian groups themselves will describe their circumstances differently when addressing their fellow countrymen or when addressing an outside audience. On many occasions, I personally have heard Christian leaders in Jerusalem and the West Bank, as well as students at Bethlehem University, discourage any talk about the plight of Christians at the hands of their fellow Muslims, insisting that the problem is not a division between Muslim and Christian, but the plight of all Palestinians together under Israeli occupation. This was also the message of Coptic Christian leaders, including the late Pope Shenouda, during the time of the so-called Arab Spring and the overthrow of the Mubarak regime. Namely, that Muslims, Muslims and Copts were all Egyptians and together loved their nation. However, that sense of unity rapidly broke down after the Muslim Brotherhood and President Morsi took command. The Coptic Christian community came out strong for the recent constitutional reform and has supported the role of the military because of their experience of violence and harassment from Egyptian Muslims and from the Muslim Brotherhood. Who are the Christians of this region? I think many of us are not familiar with the complex and highly diverse forms of Christianity that exist in the Middle East. American Christians, uh, we're used at home to multiple varieties of Protestant denominations, Evangelicals, Anglicans, and Roman Catholics. But we would be hard put to give an inventory of so-called Eastern Christians, most of us. Part of our ignorance about Eastern Christianity, I suspect, can be blamed on the New Testament itself. Because of the dominant figure of Paul, and his missionary journeys described in the Acts of the Apostles and in the testimony of his own letters, we Europeans and North Americans track the spread of early Christianity to the West, to Asia Minor, to Greece, to Rome, and then eventually to the rest of Europe, rather than to Syria and Mesopotamia. Yet we know that early Christianity also spread early on to the East. Paul, for example, goes there after his conversion experience, but except for Paul's brief sojourn in Damascus described by Luke in the Acts of the Apostles, we don't have in our sacred texts any stories about these regions of early Christianity. Compounding the problem is the fact that fairly early in Christian history, cultural and political and theological divisions separated West from East beginning with those Eastern churches who did not accept the Christological formulations of the Council of Chalcedon in 451, culminating then in the great schism of 1054 between the churches of East and West who had accepted the form of Chalcedon but were now divided especially over jurisdictional questions. We have to remember that underneath and around these theological and religious differences that the cultural and political backdrop is very important. We think of the movement of the capital of the Roman Empire 
from Rome to Constantinople under the Emperor Constantine in 324. He had a problem defending the Roman capital in the west from the increasing inroads of barbarians and besides the fact that the east was much more prosperous than the west at that time. The west compared to the east and the east compared to the west have had different cultural experiences. Latin versus Greek and uh, very different religious sensitivities and so on. And of course these differences already in place with separations at the time of Chalcedon and then further divided in 1054 would even be more alienated with the start of the Crusades in 1096 and especially the three Crusades that made it to the Holy Land from 1096 to 1192. Later Crusades up to the end of the 13th century would strike against Constantinople itself and not get to the Holy Land at all. So you can imagine the results. So that leads to a very complex family tree okay, of Eastern religions. Uh, and where to start and where to finish, I don't know. This is really basically people, uh, uh, various groups in the center of this region that I talked about. So Orthodox and Catholics, this would be the split that took place in 1054. They would be united in uh, their Christology, more or less of the, accepting the formula of Chalcedon, two natures in one person. We won't drift over into intricate Christology at this point. That'd be the second hour you can all come back for. <laughs> But uh, so under the Orthodox, there's the Greek Orthodox, there's Russian Orthodox. All of these, by the way, have representation in Jerusalem and in the Holy Land. <coughs> Romanian, Armenian, Coptic. Now this is Coptic Orthodox, uh, Chalcedonian <laughs> Coptic Orthodox, okay, who accept, uh, the Chalcedonians who accept the, uh, uh, the formulation of Chalcedon. But these are the non-Chalcedonians who would have separated in 451. Uh, the Armenians, this is the majority of the Armenians, the, by far the majority of Coptic or Egyptian Christians, Ethiopian, Syrian Christians, and the Apostolic Church of the East, Assyrian as they're referred to, uh, especially in Iraq and Syria and uh, some parts of Iran. Then we have the Latin uniate, Catholic. These would be uh, Christian groups in uh, union with the Pope, uh, but also having a great variety of liturgical forms and of spirituality, again rooted in the cultures in which they find themselves. The Latin is what uh, people in this region refer to as the Roman Catholics, okay, or the Latin Catholics. Uh, we are a very small group and uh, considered somewhat uh, outsiders, I would say, in this region, even among the Catholics. The Maronites, of course, very strong in Lebanon. The Greek Melkites uh, and the Greek Catholics, but the Melkites would have a different liturgical uh, tradition, but they would be in union uh, with Rome uh, and Greek Catholics also. Syrian Catholic, a very small group, but very important. The Coptic, very tiny. Uh, Chaldean, these would be Iraq, Assyria, they would be the cousins of this, these groups, uh, and then Armenians. Then uh, Protestants who came late to this game, <laughs> if you like, and are a very small uh, group within uh, the makeup, uh, but significant though. Uh, Anglicans there, particularly in Jerusalem, the Lutherans, the Baptists, much smaller. Church of Scotland uh, is there. The Mormons have a place now in Jerusalem. Pentecostal, uh, I'm talking about not people visiting, but people who are of this region. Now just for a little, this is a, a sidebar, but uh, th this is how this works out in the Holy Sepulchre, <coughs> which is the cathedral church of all these groups. And some of you have been there, you know so the Greek Orthodox, this is really sort of by heft, you know. So the Greek Orthodox are the strongest. They have the tomb, they have the nave, and they have a, a little chapel on top of Calvary. The Latin Catholics are in the tr side transept, 
but they also have an altar up in Calvary. Uh, the Armenians are up in the balcony in the crypt, okay? <laughs> The cops have a little place behind the tomb. If you go around behind the tomb, there's a little spot there, and the priest will tell you this is the real tomb, uh, not the one you just visited. And then the Ethiopians, the poor Ethiopians, live in huts on the roof of the Holy Sepulcher. So uh, you know, these Christians see how they love each other. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a complex, marvelous diversity and brew of Christianity, so much of it influenced by the cultures and the history of the peoples in which they are rooted. So uh, how many Christians are we talking about? And this is where things get sort of uh, interesting. In addition to appreciating the diverse forms of Christianity in the Middle East, we also need to understand how many Christians are we talking about. And here too the task is not easy. For one thing, in recent decades, there has been a tremendous influx of Latin Catholics who have come to the Middle East for economic purposes. For example, many workers in the oil industry have come from the Philippines and Latin America and to an extent from Eastern Europe to work in the oil fields of Kuwait, the Emirates, and even in Saudi Arabia. And also many service workers in hotels and resorts uh, in Israel, in Jordan, in Lebanon, and so on, uh, are there, as well as nurses and other medical employees. So these are non-native Catholics. I'm really not going to be dealing with them. What's more of a concern to us all is, I think, the native Christians of this region. <clears throat> in Israel itself, there's also been a significant influx of Christians through emigration from Russia as spouses of Jewish immigrants. The exact number is hard to come by, since many of these Christians suppress their identity in order not to create problems for their Jewish spouses about being able to enter the country. The numbers we will focus on relate to native Christians of these areas. The numbers of foreign workers and others who come and go will always fluctuate depending on economic conditions. But the real concern I think we want to deal with is the number and status of the native Christians in the region of the Holy Land. Let, let's look at these slides for a moment. I hope you can see them. I'll try to uh, explain them as you go along. Uh, here, can everybody see this uh, okay? Uh, now, I'll also give you the rough overall populations. In Egypt, there are, look at the estimates, between four and eight million. <laughs> Nobody knows for sure because censuses are not done. Many of these groups are afraid to identify various populations within their thing because of political sensitivities. But people estimate about 5% of the population. There's about 80 million people in Egypt, the largest country in this whole region. 95% of them are Coptic Orthodox, okay? Israel. Uh, 151,700, we're going to come back to that figure. It's very interesting, the circumstances of Christians in Israel. I think this is one of the things I discovered that is sort of counterintuitive. Okay. So they're 2.1% of a population of roughly 8 million. 6 million Jews, 2 million uh, Arab Israeli population for a total of 8 million. The vast majority are Greek Orthodox, followed by Latin Catholics. I'll have a breakdown later of the Catholics. Palestine, uh, two to three million people. Uh, 51,700 Christians in this area. 1.3% uh, of the population. Again, the majority Greek Orthodox and Latin. Jordan, a country of about 5.3 million people. Uh, 220,000 Christians, 3% of the population. Again, Greek Orthodox, Latin, uh, the majority. Lebanon, uh, 1.3 million out of a little over 4 million people total population. 39%, uh, you can see Lebanon has a very high percentage of Christians compared to other places in this region. The majority are Maronite Christians. Uh, Greek Orthodox and Armenians. 
Iraq, uh, a population of about 19 million, uh, 490,000 Christians, 1.3% of the population. The majority Chaldean, Assyrian, those Monophysite groups I had mentioned earlier uh, there. Uh, in Syria, 19 million people, uh, estimates again widely varying, 1.3 to 2.3 million, 4 to 10% of the population. Okay majority Greek Orthodox and Catholic. By the way, one little cruel fact that I discovered in preparing for this. There are around 18, little over 18 million people in Syria. It's estimated that over 9 million are refugees. Half of their entire population are refugees. I wonder if there's ever been a situation like this, in, certainly not in, in modern history, but we'll, we'll come back to that. So some observations about this to help put this in perspective, because I think a lot of people are feeling that the population of Christians in the Middle East is decreasing, as we'll address in a moment. With the exception of Lebanon, Christians are and have been a very small percentage of the total population of these countries uh, and have been for centuries. It's important to remember. While immigration of Christians has accelerated from all accounts in the last few years, particularly in countries such as Iraq, Syria, and Egypt, the effect in general has not been to reduce the absolute number of Christians, but to reduce their percentage of the population. It's very important to realize. The Christians are not dwindling down to uh, you know, a minuscule number. They're, they're, because of circumstances I'll name, they're sort of staying the same or experiencing only modest growth. The reasons for immigration that are uniformly cited in all the literature I came across are the following. The rise, particularly in the last few years, of incidents provoked by radical Islamic elements leading to some violence against Christians. Uh, particularly the rising custom, if we can call it that, of attacks on Christmas Eve that are taking place in Iraq and Syria and in Egypt, as well as other forms of harassment or violence. We have to realize that Christians are associated with the West in this region on the part of Islamic groups. They sh see that Christians share the religious faith of the people who are their enemies. Okay. Uh, this is exacerbated by the fact that in some regions, for example, again, Egypt, Iraq, and Syria, Christians and other minorities have fared better under secular dictatorships than they have on coalitions of people who are against dictatorships. Mubarak in Egypt, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, Bashar al-Assad in Syria uh, are, were viewed as providing protection for minorities, including Christian minorities. Now, the fact that they were supported by Christians uh, is seen by opposing groups as making them collaborators. In Egypt, Coptic Christians have openly complained of harassment and lack of protection under the regime of President Morsi and are perceived now as strong supporters of the military government that is emerging there. Uh, I'll refer to something I had a chance to listen to a number of Syrian refugees, Christian refugees, and they were uniform in opposing the, uh, the attacks against uh, the government in Syria. Okay. Because immigration among Christians, this is another fact, has been going on for more than a century, Christians, as different from other groups in the Middle East, tend to have relatives and worldwide organizations that make immigration for economic reasons a genuine possibility. This is not usually the case for Muslims or for other groups in the region. There are substantial numbers of Christians, and there have been for most of a century, of Palestinian origin, living in Argentina, the United States, Canada, and some parts of Europe, such as France. Third, ten Christians tend to be more urban, more highly educated, and have more employment skills than any other group in this region including in tests, Israeli citizens themselves. Okay. Palestinian Christians score far higher 
on uh, tests and uh, their uh, educational ability. Therefore, they have more at stake and more motivation for emigration. Based on test scores conducted in Israel, for example, I just mentioned this, Palestinian Christians have the highest test scores and graduation rates of any group in the country. Also, another factor, the contrasting birth rates of Christians and Muslims is also a very important factor here. Several studies have shown that Christian families are much smaller than Muslim families, and in Israel, even smaller than Jewish families. Christians use contraception more than Muslims, who in fact seldom use contraception. This is based on tests and surveys. And in fact, Christians use more contraception in Israel than Jewish families do. Muslim women tend to marry much earlier than Christian women. The result is, in general, the birth rate among Christians is half that of Muslims in the region. You can see what <laughs> the outcome of that is going to be. As indicated in the graphs concerning uh, Palestine and the West Bank, let me move forward with, with these. I should have done this before. Whoops. It's not moving here. Let's see. We're stuck. Can I get any help? Yeah. I see the help is on the way. No, there are a couple of slides that are very important if we can get to coming. Now I wanted to show you the percentages, what, what this means in terms of absolute numbers of people and percentages. Oh, here we go. Whoops. I'm going to go back now. Uh, okay, we looked at this slide, right? Okay. Now this is, this may not be as helpful. It's not clear. It was taken from another site. Uh, but that's the break up of Catholics in the Middle East. Okay, and you can see overall the Latins, the Maronite, the Melkites, and so on. The Maronites are huge in Lebanon, but totally the Latin Catholics are the largest in this whole region. Okay. But this is uh, something interesting. This is the Christian population in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, and Gaza since 1945, before the partition. So in 1945, the total number of Christians was... 59,160. In 2007, the latest figures available, it was 51,710. Hardly had changed. Okay. So the absolute numbers have remained the same. But look at the percentages. Okay. So in 1945, there were 59,000 Christians among 795,000 Palestinians. This is again the West Bank. It's that was, they were 7.4% of the population. When you come down to 2007 and pretty roughly what it is today, there are 51,000 Christians among 3.7 million Palestinians. <laughs> Palestinian birth rate and influx has changed the whole equation. So now the percentage of Christians is 1.3 in this area. And when people speak of the decline of Christianity in this region, they're referring to the percentages. They don't always realize that when you read the rhetoric, <laughs> but that's what it is. It's not a decline in the absolute numbers, it's a decline in the percentages compared to the Muslim uh, population for the reasons that I have, uh, have indicated. Now, uh, I think that's, let me just make sure, what do I have next here? Yeah, I'm gonna come back to the one about Israel. This is very interesting. Uh, a couple of things when we're looking now at Israel and the West Bank, you know, screen out for a moment, Iraq uh, and the other places, Egypt and Jordan and so on. The number of Christians in Jerusalem, Gaza and the West Bank, Palestine basically, East Jerusalem, has been low since before 1948. Okay. So th this is a challenge to the narrative that says the reason for the decline of Christians in this region is because of Israel. <laughs> there may be a subtle reason why that's so, but it, it's, it's not as evident. I think a lot of people looking at this would think 
that uh, the numbers of Christians in the West Bank declined, and the number of Christians particularly in Israel declined because of uh, the Israeli presence. These numbers have not declined, but for some of the reasons cited above, particularly immigration, birth rate, and the influx of Muslims into this region, the numbers have not increased as they should have, while the percentage of Christians has sharply declined. Okay. Secondly, in Israel itself, we have what might be considered a paradoxical situation. Look at these numbers. Okay. In 1945, there was 85,000 Christians. With the setting up of the state, there was an exodus of Palestinians, as you know, from the region of the state of Israel. But since then, it has generally increased uh, by 346%. The number of Christians living uh, in the state of Israel. Okay, uh, while Arab-speaking citizens of Israel, which would include the Christians, often complain of being second-class citizens and may have genuine reasons for saying so, in fact the Christian minority in Israel lives in, it has good security and has advanced both educationally and economically. The highest, uh, as I said before, the most economically and educationally advanced population of Christians in the Middle East, and in fact, the most advanced educationally and economically of any group in the Middle East are the Christian Palestinians in Israel. As a result, the numbers of Christians in Israel is growing, and there is a minimum of emigration from Israel itself. There is, we should note, a growing number of incidents in the last couple of years of vandalism and violence directed at Christian sites by such radical settler groups uh, that take the name price tag, the price tag that it would take if they try, the government try to move them out of the West Bank. But this has been denounced by the government and other Jewish citizens, although the Christians of Israel complain that not enough vigorous action is taken to punish the settlers involved for political reasons. Nevertheless, Christians of all stripes living in Israel are able to practice their faith without harassment or danger. The facts. Now, why is it important that Christians remain a vibrant, even if a minority, presence in the Holy Land? Let's turn for a moment from a consideration of the demographics of Christians in the Holy Land and the pressures they are experiencing to the positive role that the Christians of this region can play, and here I think in a special way in relationship to the conflict between Israel and Palestine. First of all, we realize that Christianity has been an integral and significant part of the history of this region for 2,000 years. People may be so used to thinking of this part of the world, with the exception of the state of Israel, as thoroughly Muslim that we could forget that the Middle East was largely Christian until the seventh century AD, before the Muslims, the Christians were there. And the collapse of the Byzantine Empire and the rise of Islam changed uh, that equation. Even with Islamic rule, Eastern Christianity continued as a significant presence and had an influence on the life and culture of this region. Christians did not disappear with the coming of the Muslims. For it to diminish to the point of insignificance, or for the Christian presence to be largely a foreign representation, would be to rob this part of the world of its history and its rich cultural and religious mix. Secondly, as noted above, the Christian population, particularly in such countries as Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, has generally exercised a moderating influence on the politics of their countries. This would be the testimony of most of the citizens, non-Christian citizens of this region. <coughs> At times there have been exceptions to this in Lebanon, the Christian phalanges, for example. But generally, Christians have not been involved in radical stances or have, used, have not used violence to achieve political goals. Some of this, no doubt, is due to the values of Christian faith, but it is also partly due to the fact that Christians are, in general, more economically stable and highly educated and have a reason, a stake in a stable political scene. 
Third, another important factor that gives Christians in this region an influence that far exceeds their numbers is the worldwide network of Christianity. Sometimes this network is problematic. The unquestioning and exuberant support of policies of the Israeli government on the part of some American evangelical Christians has, in my view, complicated the efforts of the United States government to exercise its proper influence in resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But in most instances, and I have to say this is resoundingly true of the Catholic Church, this worldwide network has been a positive force for peace and moderation. The constant influx of Christian pilgrims, both Orthodox and Catholic, has appealed to the sense of hospitality of the peoples of this region. There is rare, rare incidents in which any pilgrim of any faith has ever been attacked in this region. And it has tempered the outbreaks of violence. It is also a source of strength and comfort, as many of you who have visited there know, for the Christian minority of this region to realize that they are part of a larger worldwide community of faith that does not forget them. Very significant has been the impact of worldwide relief efforts of Catholic relief services, of Caritas, and other agencies in care for the poor and the vulnerable in all these regions. As some of you know, I witnessed this firsthand in a visit to Jordan and the West Bank in January. And to see the high respect and gratitude for humanitarian relief that comes to the peoples of these regions Muslim, Jewish, and Christian from Catholic Relief Service and from the various iterations of Caritas International. Uh, the government officials in Jordan told our group, I was there with a group of directors of uh, Catholic Charities and Catholic Relief Service, and they said by far, by far, the contribution of Catholic Relief Service and other Catholic organizations provided the most abundant and effective aid than any other group combined. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, USAID channels its humanitarian relief through Catholic Relief Service because they know it's respected by the people and the aid will get to the people in need and not be siphoned off. It was very, uh, very inspiring and moving to hear these testimonies. The moral force of John Paul II Pope Benedict himself in his visit, and now the expected visit of Pope Francis, is strongly felt in the region. The upcoming visit of the Pope in May will draw attention, uh, according to his own statement, will draw the attention of the world press and increase pressures for peace and resolution of the conflict in Syria and Iraq, as well as in Israel and Palestine. It's going to be the focus of his visit, although ostensibly it's commemorating the meeting of Athenagoras uh, and Paul VI, uh, Catholic Orthodox relations, but the Pope has signaled he wants to draw attention to the unspeakable situation of Syrian refugees. In this line, I want to offer a personal observation about the impact that Christian and Catholic faith has on those who work for peace in this area. I won't mention, although it is truly inspiring, the young men and women who work for Catholic Relief Service and these other agencies. They're all young people, it's amazing. And uh, their motto is, uh, working for CRS is not a job, it's a mission. And they certainly exemplify that. But I also want to speak of Secretary of State Curry. He visited recently uh, with Pope Francis and spoke that his faith was a motivation for his persistent efforts at peace for Israel and Palestine. I have to believe that's the case, that uh, his personal extraordinary efforts at the moment are motivated in large part by his Christian faith and his sense of the sacredness of this region. And that this is not a political statement, this is, I think, you know, the extraordinary effort he is making, which is being observed by so many in the region. I think it was also true for someone like President Carter and President Clinton and President Bush before them. They care about this region more than simply uh, strategic importance. So uh, drawing this to a close, uh, when all is said and done, what will be the fate of Christians in the Holy Land? So much depends, of course, on what happens generally in the Middle East. 
The Arab Spring gave a glimpse of hope that the oppressive political regimes and grinding poverty of much of this region might ultimately be transformed. But it is still a long way off, although many people say it will never be the same because of that uprising. Will Israelis and Palestinians solve their conflict? And if so, will this temper the influence of radical Islamic elements and improve the economic conditions of the region? If so, the pressure to emigrate might ease, and some Christians who emigrated might even return to their homeland. Christians will no doubt remain a minority in this region, and the demographics suggest they will not disappear anytime soon, but might well remain a small minority. But we can ask what kind of a minority? An overall improvement in the political and economic environment of the region would make the difference between Christians being able to be an open, active, and constructive part of their country's political and economic and religious life, or if conditions do not improve, of surviving as a fairly mute religious minority, careful not to do or say anything to threaten their survival in an alien and dominant culture. Finally, for us as Catholics and Christians, there remain some profound religious questions when, he, when we contemplate the fate of Christians in the Holy Land. One is, what should be the Catholic or Christian stance concerning the state of Israel? There is no question that Israel was founded as a secular state and not a theocracy. And support of Israel, in any case, cannot mean, as is the case for any country in the world, my country right or wrong. Israel as a human community is subject to error and can benefit from criticism, particularly from those who support it. But this does not exhaust the question for Christians. Uh, if you have any close Jewish friends, you'll know that this topic is of extreme importance to them. We have to also be aware of the terrible history of Christian anti-Semitism. Much of it founded on a theology of supersessionism that saw Christianity as the replacement for Judaism and likewise blamed Jews of all ages for the suffering and death of Jesus. While the Nazi regime was not a Christian entity and also persecuted Catholics among others, nevertheless there is little question that the deadly anti-Semitism of Nazi Germany and the resulting genocide of six million Jews was facilitated by centuries of Christian anti-Semitism and contempt for Jews from the highest levels of the Catholic community. The modern state of Israel, in the eyes of virtually all Jews, stands as a refutation of and a bulwark against this sad history of Christian anti-Semitism. For many, if not most, deeply observant Jews, the existence of Israel is also a sign of God's providence a sign that God has not abandoned them and has given them back the homeland that was promised to them by God in the scriptures. How should Christians who decry anti-Semitism respond to this? How in a particular way should Catholics, who in recent decades under the leadership of modern popes, beginning with John XXIII and down to Pope Francis, have taught that God has not abandoned his Jewish people and that Judaism is a valid religious tradition in its own right. How should we respond? The presence of the Christian community in the Holy Land raises this question in an acute way. How should Catholic Christians in Israel, for example, and the worldwide community that stands by them think about their Jewish neighbors? And what kind of reconciling and mediating role should the Catholic community play in the conflict between their religious brothers and sisters who are Jews and their ethnic and cultural brothers and sisters who are Palestinians. And lastly, as we Catholics should care deeply about our Christian brothers and sisters in the Holy Land because they are a unique witness to the central, central tenet of our faith, the incarnation. The eternal word became flesh not in the abstract, but in time and space, in a particular time, the first third of the first century. 
and in a particular place, the Holy Land, the very soil of present-day Israel and Palestine and Jordan. He was baptized probably in the Jordan River near Jericho in the Dead Sea. He ventured into Lebanon in the region of Tyre and Sidon. He went up to the border of present-day Syria when he traveled to Caesarea Philippi and probably gazed on the beauty of Mount Hermon if it was a clear enough day. If Matthew's account has historical value, Jesus and his family may have fled to Egypt across the Gaza Strip. These places and these people shaped the consciousness, the religious language, the imagery, and indeed the character of Jesus' life. The tone and feel of our Christian faith would no doubt be quite different, still valid and saving, but quite different if Jesus had been born in Peking, or Buenos Aires, or Paris, or Kenya, or Chicago. <laughs> But he was born in the land of Israel, and he was formed in the heritage of the biblical peoples. And he would die there under the jurisdiction of imperial Rome. It was this palette, the palette of the Holy Land, a palette of so many peoples and places, vistas and landscape and language and food and earth that shaped the human face of Jesus, the face that reveals God to us. And for this reason alone, we Christians should forever care about the people of the Holy Land whose ancestors gave us this gift. Thank you. Thank you, Father Don. We have about 10 minutes or so for questions if you'd like to ask Father Don any questions about his presentation. My colleague Sam um, is also over there with the microphone. So just raise your hand and we'll come to you. And comments are welcome too, so please <laughs> feel. I was surprised to see Armenia under three of those cones. Yes. Are, is Armenia, are Armenians primarily Christian? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, and these, of course, would be Armenians from present day Turkey uh, who were in the Holy Land from at least at the time of the Crusades, or possibly earlier, and then a great influx of them uh, after World War I uh, with right. the pogroms there. But that's right, these would be, uh, Armenia is often a uh, majority Christian area within Turkey. Okay, and this is why the Turks wanted the Armenians to be converted? And that was the genocide that happened there? I, I, I'm not an expert on this. I think it's more complicated, not so much conversion. It had to do as the state of the country of Turkey was being fashioned anew in the wake of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and World War I, that the loyalties of the region were considered suspect by some of the people forming the, some of the nationalist groups. And so I think it's religion and politics and that kind of uh, mix that led to it. I want to compliment you for mentioning the Eastern Rite Catholics, the Melkites and the belief and so on, of which I am one. I am a Catholic Melkite from the Middle East. Wonderful. One thing I didn't hear from you is the attacks and insults that are needed to the people, to the uh, priests, uh, brothers, men of cross of the Christian churches in Jerusalem and elsewhere. Could you address that and why is it happening? And what is going to happen? Yes. Uh, you mentioned specifically in Jerusalem and the West Bank, are you Correct. think? Yes, yeah. As well as elsewhere. Well, yes. I, well, I did mention, and maybe I should emphasize it more, that one of the first reasons for emigration was the increase in the past few years of harassment and acts of violence on the part of radical Islam against Christians in the area. Is it radical Islam or Jewish? Reason? Well, I mentioned also a Jewish, uh, particularly like price tags, some of the settlers and so on. But uh, I think in the region, compared to the threats that people are having, like the burning of churches and the attacks, uh, Christmas Eve attacks and other harassment, 
that uh, there are much more of this coming from certain radical groups. Uh, I, I am not trying to paint Islam in a negative way at all because there are many, uh, majority of uh, Muslims who decry this as well. But I think compared to the attacks by Jewish radical groups, uh, you know, who wants to have a contest like this? But I think it's still a majority on the side in the region. But there are uh, harassments happening from some radical groups, particularly from among the settlers against uh, Christians. Is the church doing anything about it? Well, the church uh, there in Israel is certainly protesting this, as is uh, worldwide uh, Christianity. And they feel that the government has not been, the, the government denounces it immediately, as do many Jewish groups in the United States. But they feel that the response has not been as thorough because of political sensitivities to the settlers. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a complex uh, situation. I, I would also point out, and this may be a part of your point and your question, which I appreciate. Uh, you know, a few years ago, the uh, groups occupied the Basilica of the Nativity and it was besieged, this is during the Intifada, by the Israeli armed forces. Uh, the outcry on the part of Christians around the world at one of the most sacred possible sites, <laughs> the birthplace of Jesus, was rather tepid. And we might compare it to what would be the outcry as was the case if there was a perceived desecration of the Temple Mount <laughs> or other sacred sites. I think there's a certain, what would you say, confidence or insulation from the plight of Christians the vulnerability of Christians in the Middle East that leads uh, Christians to be more complacent in the response to these problems. So, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Oh, yes, uh, I know the Archdiocese tries to expose its high school teachers to Israel as a democracy. Um, now, I was wondering if you would comment on the reality of Israel as a democracy, given its primary commitment to remain a Jewish state. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that's not a trick question, but <laughs> well, this, of course, is a huge discussion and question uh, in Israel itself. Uh, what does it mean to be a Jewish state? what would be the implications for citizens of Israel who are not Jewish? Um, and, uh, you know, does this rob it of its potential as a democracy? Uh, these are huge questions that are very much to the fore uh, in the discussion right now. Uh, and, and I don't have a magic wand about this. I think it complicates things the insistence on it being a Jewish state, and that is an insistence that is relatively reasonable, re recent, uh, I should say. But let me say this, uh, the Archdiocese, as you point out, has done, I think, marvelous work uh, having teams of Jews and Muslims and Christians visiting classrooms and talking about customs, and there's been a long commitment of uh, Catholic-Jewish dialogue here in Chicago in many forms. And some of you are participants in it for many, many years. But the question that I raised at the end is something more complicated than uh, Israel's future as a democratic state in the full sense of the term, if it's a Jewish state. And that is, what are we, what are we to think of Israel? Is it, it is a, a secular state by intent in its founding. But particularly for the Jewish community, the leadership of the Jewish community, except for the very radical Orthodox Jews who don't recognize the state of Israel because it was not founded as a religious state. But for the other the vast majority, uh, this is rising to the surface as the most important and sensitive question in the Catholic Jewish dialogue. Um, is there any religious significance to the fact that now, after 2,000 years, 
we have a Jewish state. <laughs> um, so I don't know the answer to that question either. Well, thank God time is almost up. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think, you know, uh, we're an incarnational people and we think God works through history. And so I don't think we can be indifferent to this question. Uh, you know, why, uh, particularly uh, because of the history of Catholic Jewish relations. I just would end with a, a little incident that uh, I've uh, shared with others, and some of you are aware of it. When John Paul II visited uh, Israel in 2000, when he first came, there was uh, very little stir, this elderly man visiting. And, you know, it'd be like the head rabbi coming here. We might be mildly interested. But as he visited President Wiseman, who himself was revered uh, in Israel, and they had obvious rapport, as he went to the wall and put in the prayer of asking forgiveness for the sins of Christians against the Jews, and then went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, which every head of state is expected to visit, and Pope Francis will visit as well. When he was there, uh, the Pope met a group of Jewish friends from Poland. It was a very emotional reunion, including a woman that he personally had rescued and had not seen for 50 years. And they embraced uh, passionately. Uh, and then uh, the Pope uh, was ready to be introduced by uh, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who was Prime Minister at the time, who was obviously moved by what he had just seen. And he said, Holy Father, by your presence here and by your demeanor, 2,000 years of relationships between our people have come full turn. And uh, I think, you know, we're living in an unusual time, uh, which makes this question of the Christian presence in the Holy Land all the more acute, <laughs> all the more important for our consciousness of our heritage and our consciousness of our sinfulness uh, in our history and of the need and the possibility of reconciliation. So thank you all very much. For